Okay, guys. So it looks like we are live. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Jeffries, and today I have joining me two fantastic local bloggers and social media influencers, Lee and Stacy. And we're going to just chat with them about their personal experiences with the craft distillery market and uh, small batch spirits. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the ladies and let them introduce themselves to you. Thank you, Lisa, for having me today. My name is Lee Hines, and I am the owner of the Hindsight Blog and at About NC. Um, I am a lifestyle travel blogger, so uh, with a hotel emphasis on my blog. So I, I get to taste a few cocktails now and then, which is fun. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> awesome. And Stacy, how about you? Hi, I'm Stacy's friends, and um, I am a uh, brand ambassador for a couple of local brands, a uh, commercial photographer in the food and beverage industry, and also have a blog um, called I Cook, I Eat, It's Life. I live in the Apex area, and um, my goal with everything that I do is to basically support and help grow my food and beverage community. Fantastic. Thanks, ladies. I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, so the first question is just to kind of gauge um, the history of craft spirits in your life. So um, do you remember your first introduction or experience with craft distilling? And if not, perhaps more broadly, what got you interested in craft spirits? Okay, I'll start because I'm definitely not an expert in this. And it's <laughs> me. I have come such a long way when it comes to especially the craft brew industry. I remember when I was in college, and guys, that's a long, long time ago. I graduated from UNC Chapel Hill in 1991. You know, I didn't really drink a lot of beers back then. And I think I had my first beer maybe after college, and it wasn't a very good one. Let's just put it that way. By the pool, but it was nice and refreshing because it was cold. And my husband has always been a beer drinker, and he would bring more and more local craft brews into our um, outside refrigerator. And so one of the things is I started very light on the lighter side, like the Heaven Wisens and things like that. And then we'd go to a couple of trips and tourists and breweries, and I got more and more interested. And then the funny thing is, he jokes now when he talks to people, is that I'm actually stealing the darker beers out of his refrigerator now. He says he can never keep those in stock. So I have really come a long way in the 25 years, and I am such a craft brew. And I really honestly don't drink anything else but local craft brews, honestly. Awesome. How about um, when you're purchasing wine or spirits? Are you finding that your palate's a little more refined now as a result of your experience with the craft beer industry? I think so. I also think that I have become more open to actually trying different types of beer, um, especially like last year. I remember at the Raleigh Food and Wine Festival, um, I really said I was not an IPA fan. I'm like, no, nope, don't like them, don't like them, but I was more open to trying one, and I fell in love with it. So I think so. I think the more exposure I've had, the more I'm open to try the different varieties. Fantastic. Stacy. how about you? What are the early beginnings of your experience? Well, with the you know, I have to say that um, I, I have always enjoyed cocktails and spirits and I really didn't think about local spirits until I met Esteban from Tapo Distillery. And he, you know, just listening to him kind of do his spiel and about the kind of local trend in distilled spirits was, was interesting to me. I absolutely love local products and it kind of, you know, had me thinking, wow, you know, local products goes beyond produce, meats, eggs, things like that. And actually, we're starting to see you know, local products being made in the distillery and spirits world. And um, I would say that I was, I kind of fell fast and hard for local spirits. Um, then it got me thinking, okay, well, what else is out there? Are they the only ones? And, um, you know, obviously at that point, uh, that was about three to four years ago. And so, you know, at that point, it was, you know, they were kind of the forefront of that. But you started to see other places pop up. And I think especially because we're such a heavy social media driven um, food and beverage industry here in the Triangle, it was neat to see new ones kind of come online, um, so to speak, in, in the Twitter sphere and in Facebook and then really start to kind of search them out and know their story. So I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to the small batch, you know, craft spirits uh, within the last three to four years and it was definitely, you know, um, top of the hill distillery that, you know, kind of pulled me in. 
and I would agree with that too, Stacy. Um, and I tell you, it really was a change gamer for me with Top of the Hill Distillery because, you know, I saw how it was made, but the taste and the actual tasting was unbelievable, to, unbelievable to me. And honestly, you know, now when it comes to that type of alcohol, I don't buy anything but crap on that. I, I really don't buy my gin and tonics have all changed, my vodka tonics. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I, I don't drink them, you know, all the time, and you know, I. But that has really been my buying habits because going into that distillery and seeing the difference in the tasting, tasting other products, and learning, it has really created for me to be one of their best customers when I go and buy my alcohol at an ABC store. Fantastic. That's actually uh, one of the questions we're going to lead into later. Is about. Uh, about the buying behavior now when you're when you're particularly going out and seeking out the products. So hang on to those thoughts. Okay. Uh, the okay. next question I want to ask you about before we get to that is um, do you find yourself seeking out restaurants or bars that serve craft or small batch products when you're planning a night out or an afternoon out with friends? Um, do places that have you know specialty cocktail menus uh, get more of your business than others? I, I would like to answer that if I can. Um, I, I definitely choose where I'm going to go and enjoy an evening or even like bringing friends into, um, you know, friends that come into town and wanting to, you know, do a night out with them. I do choose based on, um, you know, their overall local piece of their menu. And in my opinion, that does definitely include um, their beverage program. Um, and I think, too, uh, with the advent of things that go along with the wonderful distillery um, that we have going on, crude bitters. Um, I'm Craig Rudowitz is a friend of mine, and um, I really like to see that not only are they using you know local craft distillery um, products, but they're also using you know bitters that are made right here as well that really complement all of those flavors because he works with those distillers. So um, that is a huge piece of what. Um, I look for and you know seasonal produce also being part of that kind of craft cocktail you know um, focus uh, for the beverage program at most of the, the local restaurants and bars so that's that's number one on my list awesome Lee how about you and maybe even uh, you could talk about what you've seen when you're traveling at some of the the luxury resorts and hotels you've had a chance to go to yes well you know I have been covering the luxury travel hotel market for about five years and you know I've been exposed to that type of the craft brews and the craft cocktails and the special drinks for years and it's always a treat and I always make a point to try new things um, you know I'm a mom I'm an older mom I have a six-year-old I have a ten-year-old and I didn't realize how much I do plan my dinners or my outings based on what is served in terms of and enjoyment for us. We were older parents, and so our whole. When I started my blog several years ago, I said, you know, I feel like the kids need to be, to be part of that experience. So I really do seek out restaurants that mom and dad can have a nice beverage or cocktail when we're eating. And I ate with some friends in a chain restaurant. I don't do it very often, but I did, and I was. It happens. It happens. I have to say, you know, I I don't do it very often, but this is a very kid-friendly restaurant, and I wanted a beer, and I looked at the menu, and I about died because I think for so long I have not been exposed to some of the restaurants that didn't have all the craft brews that my husband and I frequent, or the restaurants we go to. My children and I was like. Uh, I, I don't even know what to order, and so it was just it was a it was an amazing experience to me because there is that segment that you know. Um, last summer I did a story with the Ritz Carlton D.C. I did a story with the Grand Hyatt and their craft cocktails, and and Ritz Carlton Pentagon City. So I have been exposed to you know always great, not even just North Carolina. I'm talking about when we go to a different states and they have the craft brews there. Um, and the craft cocktails. So yes, it was kind of eye-opening to me. I think I've lived in a world for a while that I thought that there was craft brew in almost every restaurant now, and I realize there's not. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny how much uh, I think you know. We're very fortunate to live in the Triangle area where our food and beverage options are very progressive. And I think as soon as you you know travel more than an hour hour outside of this area, you realize really quickly. Um, it feels like the norm here, and but it's it's really not so much norm everywhere else. I was uh, telling Lee before we jumped off jumped on the call that 
Um, for the last four months, I was living over in the south of France in a very um, tourism-heavy zone, and I, I was telling her it's kind of like living in Wilmington 20 years ago. It's not chef-driven. It was a lot of pizza, pasta, and the same, and, yeah. you know, the foodie in me who wanted to, to try all these great cocktails and wines, and, you know, uh, I really just wasn't in the, in the right region for that, and that's not to say it doesn't exist in France. There are certainly uh, more metropolitan areas that are completely driven by a chef culture, um, but I was, you know, quickly reminded that, oh, man, I'm, I'm counting down the four months until being back in Raleigh, so <laughs> that way I just have a little variety in my life. What? I can completely understand that. When you go without it, like Lee was saying, you kind of get kind of that, I, I, we do have a little bit of a bubble here, but it's a good bubble. <laughs> I'll stay in the bubble gladly. <laughs> North Carolina, but you do notice sometimes when I go to the coast, you have a lot less choices in beer that we may have here in the Triangle because we have so many, and then, of course, Asheville has so many. But one of the things that I was going to say through my experience, and even as just a consumer, not as a reporter, not as a journalist, and what I do is that I have found that the education and the events that these craft breweries or wineries are having to actually teach and help us understand, like I have to be honest, I never really had a very sophisticated wine palette. I didn't really, I mean, yes, I drank wine, but I didn't really know my likes or what I really truly liked about it. And so I did a story in the North Carolina wine region in Yadkin Valley and it was so eye-opening to me because I tasted the wines, I learned about how they were made, and it has really helped me not only as a consumer in the grocery store, I'm just becoming more, I just feel like I'm just the education alone has helped me make better choices when I'm out buying. It's harder to find our North Carolina wines at that level in the Triangle. They're only Southern Season Southern. There's not all available. You do have to go to the wineries. But it was very educational to me that I learned what I started liking. And Foggy Ridge Cider is another example. I mean, I was at Terra Vida. I had not really tried cider before. I mean, I'd had a North Carolina. I liked it. Then I tried all of the Foggy Ridge at Terra Vida, and my friend and I were so impressed. And I'm like, I gotta find that. Where is that? And so, it's just to me, it's also about education, and it's fun to learn. I feel like you know, sometimes as adults, we forget that we have we need to learn about things. And so I think that's been the interest for me on a personal level. It's fun for me to go to a festival, taste foods, learn more about the wines. It's Absolutely. Not about just drinking, it's about education too. <laughs> well, and I think when a brand has a story to tell that they get to tell to the consumer, that makes a personal relationship for the consumer with the brand that makes them want to buy the product. They they all of a sudden know the family that's involved and they know the history of it and they've seen it in production and um, you know they they feel a connection that that makes them go out and, and spend more, maybe more of a premium for that product. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, so the next question is, uh, going back to that retail experience, um, could you share any positive or negative experiences about purchasing craft or small batch products in the retail environment? Um, obviously, we're all in North Carolina, so we have a control state where liquor and spirits have to be purchased through ABC stores. Uh, I know there's been a lot of chatter on our social media networks lately about um, some frustrations with finding North Carolina products in those shelves. Um, so maybe if you can talk a little bit about that, but also if you've been purchasing outside of the area when you travel, um, have you seen great examples of, of retail environments for these products, or you know, ha has there seemed to be a challenge kind of universally with, with purchasing small batch products? I would love to touch on that um, because this is something that I have become because I do really want to um, make my purchases, you know, based on local craft distilleries, small batch distilleries. Um, this has become a huge source of frustration for me and something that I'm super passionate about to the point that I've reached out to many of the distillers and to the association to see what as a consumer I can do to make this less frustrating. Um, it's very easy to go to a farmers market or know that there is a co-op that has local produce or even go to a farm stand and you know that you're basically supporting that that family, that company who's you know putting those dollars back into the local economy. 
And I think that um, my frustration stems from the fact that because we have the ABC system um, you and the way that it's structured, I'm not sure that the that their focus, well, I know their focus isn't, but I, the local piece of that is really not where it needs to be, in my opinion. Um, I think that the, you know, buy one October one campaign was great, and that was, you know, the ability for people to take a distillery tour and buy one bottle per year from that distiller. I think that that kind of was a game changer. Um, I would like to see that change things in the ABC world because it's still very difficult for me living in Southern Wake County to find some of the some of the products of the people that you know I want to support at my local ABC stores. I sometimes have to go to four or five different stores to get the things that I need, and in my opinion, that's crazy. You know, the, these are local North Carolina products. This is a state-run organization. The revenue stays in our state. It's not going to some, you know, big distillery in New York or California or wherever. And I just think that kind of the focus of that needs to shift so that when I walk into an ABC store, so that when Lee walks into an ABC store, even if they're at opposite ends of North Carolina, that, you know, we can find the products that we're looking for that are made right here in our state. I will say that... Um, I have noticed that there has been a little bit of a shift. That, uh, in particular, the Cameron Village ABC, which is a brand new, um, you know, location for them, kind of across the the shopping center. I was very pleased to see that there were some things that I'd been looking for um, that I that I was able to to purchase in there, um, and that they had a really, you know, decent um, piece of you know real estate for their North Carolina products. That's um, awesome. But I do find it frustrating overall. Um, because I have people that constantly come to me when I've posted on social media about, well, where do you get that? And the problem with it is, I can't actually say where you get that, because I can tell them the ABC store, but the ones that are near them may not have it. So I've been really kind of driving that back to the distilleries, because I do think that, you know, if we participate in a way that makes it so that the distilleries are selling more bottles one-on-one, -on -one, that perhaps the ABC as an organization will kind of sit up and take notice that that's revenue that they're losing sure, and that maybe absolutely. they need to give more, you know, more, you know, credence and more, you know, respect to what these folks are doing and that it, the distillers from my conversations really want to work with the ABC to make sure that, you know, it, it can be available to their customers everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was first introduced to Top of the Hill, and when I told you my story earlier, um, I had not been in an ABC store in a very long time. And so it was my first experience really going back into one, because I do drink so many craft brews a lot at home. And um, it was very difficult to find. I mean, I was able to find it. But, you know, you go in there, and it's like a warehouse type thing. And I ended up just going up and down the aisles until I found the Top of the Hill. And luckily for me, I was able to find that. But it wasn't, I think what Stacey's saying is very important, and I actually agree with her as well. Fantastic. Um, so that kind of dovetails to the next question. Have you visited any craft distilleries at their primary place of business or, or production facilities? And can you talk about uh, what kind of experience that was? Oh, I've done a lot. Um, not recently. Um, and. I am like drawn a blank, but I was in one recently in Durham and fell in love with it. And Stacey, you can pipe in on the name, so I apologize for not remembering. Was it um, Durham Distilling? Yes. Durham yes. Distilling? Yes. Do you remember? Yeah, they're great. Um, Melissa's <laughs> great. <Yeah. laughs> so I learned about their liqueurs at that and immediately, you know, fell in love. And I haven't actually found those um, in a store yet, so I probably do need to look for that. But that was my latest one that I. I'll send. I'll send you the down low on where to get it. <laughs> Because I found it. <laughs> I know, and I'm trying to remember which one I liked the best. I think the one that was my favorite was the one in the middle. The one that's got a little bit of coffee and chocolate. Oh, or the mocha. Yes, yes. That's a good one. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And that, and they're using local products. They're using uh, slingshot coffee and Vidari chocolate. So you know, they're finding a way to collaborate with local folks, which yeah, I love. That's a win for everyone. Oh, it is. It is. Why would you not want to support that and put it in every store possible? <laughs> yeah. I, I'd be almost worried that if it got out, they couldn't produce as much demand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. 
Small growth, small growth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it on the inner circle for now, but when they increase their production facilities, we'll let everyone know. Exactly. One thing I do want to add, I'm going to bring in my hotels again, because, you know, when we're in, now we've got some great boutique properties in Durham, and you're seeing, like, um, 21C and the Durham Hotel, and people are going there because they see it as a place to eat and restaurant, and, but a lot of time the myth, a lot of times about hotels and the consumer is uh, they don't ever really walk into those sometimes because they think that they're not traveling and that's just for people who um, spend the night. And I mean, I've dealt with that for years and it's even as far as, you know, like the Umstead. I mean, they welcome us as locals to come in there and just grab a cup of coffee during the day, bring our laptop. I mean, so, but a lot of people just don't think about going to a hotel restaurant sometimes to dine because they're not from out of town. And they feel like that, you know, like those types of places, they think of hotels differently than I do. I've always thought differently. But I think that these boutique properties are being game changers on that, and they're actually getting consumers in the door that are local. And I think we're going to see start seeing more and more of that. We need some boutique properties in Raleigh. We just had the Kempton brand come to North Carolina. It opened this week um, with guests on Tuesday for the first time. It's the Cardinal Winston-Salem. And, um, you know, that's going to be a game changer for that area. And you see it in Asheville. So I think more and more people are going to be going to these hotels because they are on the trend of having these craft cocktails and things like that. That's awesome. That's good to hear. Um, I've been to um, Top of the Hill Distillery, and I've also been to Fair Game Beverage. Um, both very different in what they do and how they do it, which is kind of the neat part, is that, you know, um, I think there is variety amongst our distillers as there is with any industry, and that's nice to see, and I don't think you necessarily can see that only through the product. I think going to the distillery and really talking to these people and seeing their passion, um, you know, fair game. One of the things, again, that I love about them that they do similar to Tapo is that they, you know, are using a, you know, sustainable product that is very kind of conscious of how they're choosing the product to use in their distilling process. And I think that's a huge piece of, you know, they're not just out there to make a good alcohol or a good spirit. They're out there to be very conscious about having a sustainable program in order to do that and collaborating with, you know, local, you know, uh, local producers to make some of these, you know, liqueurs and beverages that they make. Um, I would love to see a way for more groups of people to go visit distilleries. Um, I know that there is a passbook that the um, North Carolina Department of um, Agriculture and that got to be NC folks have out. Um, where you can kind of, you know, do a little, you know, stamp at each distillery. And I think that, you know, um, as people who are very social media driven, um, I think that Lee and myself and other social media, you know, um, you know, people and bloggers and people that are interested in this, you know, we need to make sure that we're sharing that, that people can do that. Um, that going and, you know, that the distilleries are, are, are open and that they have tours and that they have tasting rooms where, you know, when you're looking at a bottle of alcohol that costs anywhere between, say, $25 to $40, that's, for some people, that's an investment in their personal bar program. And I understand, you know, having it in a drink, but all at a restaurant, and then wanting to purchase it, but not knowing, like, what am I going to do with this? Because I really just want to taste the product. And the dis going to the distilleries is just the best way to do that, and really talking about them. And they know their product. They'll tell you what to mix with it or how to utilize it. And I think that is, that goes back to the education component and going out, exactly. and yeah. out of the triangle. And we're still in the triangle, but out. But like Johnston County Tourism, for example, they yeah. have started the Wine, Shine, and Dine Tour. Beer, beer Wine, Shine. you got to run. Beer, Wine, Shine, and Dine <laughs> Tour. They are developing a tour where they're taking a bus and you know they give you that path, great maps for that where you can go to Broad Slab Distillery in Smithfield and you can go to the winery and you can go to uh, Deep Barley Brewing or Deep River and you can go to those different places and actually learn. And I think that you're going to see more and more on the tourism trend. Um, when I work a lot with the Out About NC community, I work with a lot of tourism bureaus and as a reporter as well. And I can see that's an area that they're very much focusing on and getting these types of tours together. 
um, for people that are coming because people are coming to the state simply because they have a huge interest in food and beverage. I mean, it's huge and people like to know. There's a certain type of demographic now that loves to eat local. They like sustainability and the tourism markets are starting to market for that a little bit more. So you're going to be seeing more and more, I think, tours when they actually have the breweries and making it easy for people in the marketing and the packaging where they have maps that will take you, you know, to go from here to there. And so, I mean, Johnson County would be a fun, you know, day trip and learn. I've yeah. been day trips and, um, and fallen in love with their beers because of it. So, yeah, there's, I think that's really easy. We're getting a brewery in Nightdale now. So it's, it's actually spreading out the triangle and to the rural areas. So I, I love that. I love that. It's a good form of urban sprawl. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I always said I could move anywhere if they had a coffee shop and a brewery. <laughs> <laughs> well, in North Carolina, I think you're in good company. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that very much leads into my last question, and you guys have touched on this a little bit, but I just want to um, you know, kind of frame a specific question around it. Um, do you attend events where you get a chance to experience these products, um, specifically, for example, festivals, uh, special restaurant dinners, things like that. Um, and if you can, please share briefly about the impression that this leaves on you and, and the experience that, that you get to have at those events. I, um, I would say that I pick my events based on those pieces. Um, you know, the local piece is always very important to me and I think that if they're, you know, doing something with local spirits, I definitely you know, want to go see what that's all about. I love to experiment at home, but I get my inspiration from the things that I see when I'm out and about and by talking with those folks. Um, on a professional level, I do a lot of recipe development because I'm a brand ambassador for Foggy Ridge Cider and, you know, I really strive to use in some of the cocktails that I come up with that are cider-based cocktails, use some of the local spirits. I did a class with Craig Rudowitz at Crude Bitters and we used flying pepper. Now, you know, Craig is a genius and he has a lot more experience in bartending than I do and to think about putting a you know Tobago pepper vodka with a cider I was like oh wow and it was amazing and so like that collaborative piece of you know when you go to a dinner or you go to a class or an event that collaborative piece of seeing you know maybe one or two local brands kind of collaborating with each other I think like that's what makes my world go round. That is exactly what I'm looking for when I'm thinking, you know, what do I want to spend my money on? What what do I want to make sure I don't miss? Um, you know, we have an amazing food scene, but I think that the huge compliment to that food scene is, um, you know, not only our our, our local, you know, uh, breweries, um, but and our wineries as well, but also totally totally legit is our you know craft distillers and our small batch distillers because I think there's a huge place in there um, to you know pair things with cocktails and even using local ingredients in cocktails to the point of everything from produce to local bitters to other other uh, spirits and you know I would say that that I'm pleased to be a consumer of those events and I'm very pleased to be someone who is involved in facilitating those events. And I'm going to add about the events. I'm going to throw a different spin, actually, from Stacy. Um, I I would love to be able to go to a lot of beer dinners and wine dinners and different things. But like I said, you know, I'm 47. My husband will be 50 this year. We have two kids. We have a six-year-old and a ten-year-old. And what happens with us is, in terms of our being a consumer, is we have to pick and choose too. So because what happens with us is we pay for a sitter. So we're, you're looking at $85 tickets per person, and then you're looking for another, when you're gone, another $100 for uh, the babysitter. It gets expensive. So I have to definitely pick and choose. So what I would like to see with restaurants and different places is to be able to, you know, have weeks or something where they may could just advertise and feature these things so that my husband and I maybe could go and try a few things or go and have dinner at that restaurant for the first time. And I think, you know, that that it sounds funny, you know, talking about someone that covers luxury travel and I do, but that's what I do. I cover luxury travel. That does not mean I have the ever ending budget that I would love to have. <laughs> and, I, 
that a lot of people are like me. I mean, we all have bills to pay. We have soccer to pay. We have, you know, dance. And so I love the concept and the idea of all the beer dinners, but you know, there's no way that I can personally even afford to do that all the time. But what I can do is get a sitter and, you know, go to a restaurant if they're advertising that they're having, you know, special pairings and it's on their menu and I actually see it. And I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I may actually try that. He's put this with that together and let's do that. I'm, I know that's hard for them to do, but it's hard for me. I would love to be able to attend more wine and beer dinners, but they do get expensive. Oh, That's absolutely. a good point, though. I know that um, Asheville is doing a um, cocktail week where they're doing um, it's you know part of the Imbibe Festival, and so they're doing a week of restaurants, you know, kind of showcasing the cocktails that they do. And I know that not all of them will be done with small batch distillery products, but you know a lot of them will will be. And I think that you know that goes. You know, to a, to an interesting point that you make, Lee, is that you know you want to enjoy that, but maybe not in an event, but maybe at you know an event that is you know kind of come almost like Restaurant Week, like come and go as you please. And um, I think that there's something to be said for that of adding kind of those layers or those components even to Restaurant Week of it being about everything kind of celebrating local restaurants, but also celebrating local products. And that means everything, you know, that, that kind of is under that umbrella. And the one thing that I noticed that I particularly liked and was, you know, we've had North Carolina Beer Month, so of course there's been, you know, lots of publicity about that. But I went to a restaurant recently, and every week during the month of April, they worked with a certain brewery. So when you had dinner that week, they had, you know, the regular beers they always sell or whatever, but they also had a special page of, like, introducing um, the brewery to you. And so it may, really when you learn and you see, like, different things, you're like, why not? Why don't I try their Heffenweizen? Or why not I try, you know, their car caramel mo mocha yum yum, whatever. I mean, it's just really, yeah, you can tell, like, these dark beers, right? They're like, oh. it just, it, it causes you to really branch out and maybe get over your comfort zone. And I think some people just need that exposure. And if we could funnel it down, you know, we are very fortunate that we have a lot of great chains here in North Carolina that have that diversity and that will serve the craft brews too. Uh, like Be Good is, you know, that's a chain, but it serves craft brews and they're working with local farmers. And so I think we're fortunate that we are all getting exposed to that more as we can just filter it down for everywhere of like maybe these small industries, you know, pairing with a restaurant and helping them market, you know, for a week. Because it's really enabled me to try different things. You know, sometimes I don't venture off when I really love a restaurant. You know, I don't venture off the menu as much because that was just so good. But right. I've known to, you know, try something new in the industry or wine. Wine's a big one for me because I don't have a lot of education in that area. Um, and the same thing with the distilleries. You know, why not try a cocktail if it's recommended? That sounds good. And so I think those are where education really comes in with the consumer because we don't know. I mean, we really don't know. Um, I, Like I said, I'm not an expert on this. I don't know what all this stuff means together, how you put it all together. And I, I certainly don't do it at home like Stacy does. I wish I did. Stacy, you're coming over tonight, right? <laughs> but those are important because I think, you know, education and all of this, you know, there's the marketing side, but I think if people see the different breweries or the different distilleries, they want to learn from it. I really do. And, and I think that would be, I think that whole case of them focusing on a certain brewery really helped me try that brewery. Now, it just happened to be a brewery that I had tried before and loved, so I was kind of excited. And I didn't go there specifically because I knew it was the brewery was partnered together. But if it had been another brewery, you know, I'd have been as excited as well. I think well, that's a good idea, though. You know, I mean, I think the breweries have been around longer, the wineries have been around longer, and perhaps maybe um, the craft distillers can take a page off of that book yeah. as you know, a way to, you know, expand uh, their market. You know, um, I do think, you know, what 
I, I'm, I won't say I won't say specific um, brands, but why use a rum that is made somewhere else when you can get a rum that's made right here? Why use you know vodka that's made somewhere else when you can use a vodka? You know, a lot of times I will I I am a bar scanner, so I will walk in even if I'm not sitting near the bar. I will stop and kind of scan all the bottles. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times they're not putting in their in their menu, they'll they'll just say vodka. I've well, noticed that even at places yeah. that you know are promoting and towing the the craft product line, they're not, they're not yeah, I'm gonna buy that drink, even if it's fifteen dollars because it sounds amazing and you're using a local product. I'm willing to spend more money if I know that you are committed to a local product, and I know that you know a lot of the craft cocktails that are made with and without local spirits are quite pricey. Um, but I also am looking at that as it's a craft cocktail, meaning that someone is not just, you know, looking at their, you know, um, you know, cocktail book and coming up with something with, you know, they're, 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 it's, it's about the creative process. And I know that if they're buying local spirits, you know, that, that, that makes me feel good about spending that money. So I do think, um, you know, maybe more exposure might help. You know, right. drive sales and drive interest, and give a give it a, a way to educate, like Lee said. And I'm back on the education again. You're going to hush me up about that. But you also too, you've got to have the excitement when you're partnering the distillery and the restaurant partnering together. You've got to have that education down to the staff. So when you're sitting there and you've got this, you know, the features and make it easy. You need to have that waiter say, oh, we have this fantastic local. They're the salespeople. They're the salespeople yeah. for that, you know, because it's like, you know, when they come and read the specials, haven't you ever been in our shoes where you're like, oh, that sounds really good. And and that's, that's what it is. I mean, they're the ones that can promote that cocktail and the local and get all excited about that and filter that energy down. And so, I mean... You can read, but you also need to kind of get the staff involved as well. Yeah. Uh, getting that excitement out for them and saying, oh, this is a great, you know, our bartender has put together this wonderful for the spring season. Like, I can still remember. And, you know, I think we're all, we all remember food and our experiences, and I'm really big on my blog about food and travel and where you remember different things. And I still to this day, like four or five years ago, I can remember a cocktail that I had at Second Empire Restaurant and Tavern in the bar. And, you know, I don't, at the time, you know, I don't know what was in the cocktail. I don't remember it now. But, I mean, I just remember just raving about that cocktail. And as we're talking about that, all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about that craft cocktail that that bartender took care in and put together for their, their spring menu. And, you're right. This is it's artistry as well. I mean, it's it definitely takes talent to come up with that. So you're right. Not a cocktail book, but staff <laughs> has to get that excitement in that as well when they're selling their products. Sometimes the menu just doesn't do it. Sometimes you need yeah. a bit of nudging. Well, I'm really excited to hear you ladies uh, share these points because uh, something I'll share with you now, which uh, we're going to be getting the word out about sooner rather than later, is that. Once the Food and Wine Festival wraps up in May, we are um, moving full steam ahead with a cocktail week program for the broader Raleigh area in the fall. So um, I'm super Please. excited about it. Yeah, it's Please been about a year. Let me know how I can support that. Oh my um, God! <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna bring you girls in for drinks and, and brain trust of just ideas for it. Um, Yay! The one thing that I'm excited about is that we're looking at not just focusing on the downtown Raleigh market, which is obviously you know flush with, with opportunities, but also, um, you know, looking at North Raleigh, there's some great things happening. Uh, for example, up in Lafayette Village, Driftwood has a fantastic cocktail program going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, really excited to hear you guys say these things, because that's exactly the validation that I wanted to hear, that people are thirsty for this. So, um, definitely keep an eye out for that. And like I said, I'll be uh, pinging you girls for some ideas. That sounds great. It really does, and even if you can expand it off into Apex and Holly Springs and you know, Fuquay and all those areas, because I will tell you, you know, I'm a tired parent. I know a lot of other tired parents, and I think that they all like, I mean, I live very close to downtown Raleigh, so going downtown to Raleigh to me is where I go every day. 
But there are so many people in our triangle that going to downtown Raleigh is a an event. I mean, the whole night out. It, it is like whoa. Like I, I had some people come from Wake Forest that never comes. You know, when I was at, they were at my dinner for table. Uh, and the same thing. You know, they want to have that experience nearby, close to home. Right. You know, like some of the like the little hen or you can get up with them because there's you know that restaurant. People just like to stay close to home sometimes, yeah. and they can still experience the same thing that you can experience in Durham and. Well, that's very exciting, Lisa. I'm excited about that. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, like I said, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, just have to get out of the weeds of the Food and Wine Festival first, which is also, <laughs> you know, in its second year, we've got a lot of uh, spirits involved in that. We've had spirits involved from the very beginning. So uh, I'm excited to, you know, get that um, going. That's in the middle to end of May. So we'll definitely see you girls out there. Um, and like I said, I'll tap you for your brain trust of ideas in the fall as well. Sounds um, good. Sounds I want to be good. conscious of your time, so as we wrap up here, are there any final thoughts on craft spirits as a whole that you'd like to share before we sign off? I would say that just that, you know, there are real people behind these products and, you know, they're either sharing um, a longtime recipe or a passion that they have, um, and they're part of our community. And so when you support what they do, you're supporting your community at large. And so I think that, you know, when you walk into an ABC store or you walk into a restaurant, you have a choice and you can exercise that choice. Awesome. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> well, y'all, thank you so much for your time. Fantastic insight. Really appreciate you uh, being willing to share your opinions and your experiences with us. Um, looking forward to sharing the final culmination of this entire project with you guys. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, y'all. Always good to see you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.